Welcome back to Building Character, where we figure out how to play as your favorite fictional characters in Dungeons & Dragons. Remember to like and subscribe to pass your death saves next time you play. Maybe. Today we're building Sekiro from the game Sekiro Shadows Die Twice. I don't know what Sekiro means, but you're a one-armed wolf with a knack for not dying. Unless I'm playing, then you'll die so much you'll eventually give up and ask your buddy to record the footage for you because they're better at the game. Thanks, Jake. Somebody once told me the world is gonna roll me. Let's start off with our goals for this build first. Dying. Bad. Let's not do it, or at least be able to bounce back really quickly the first time we do. Next, we'll get mobility options to jump around like we're in a figurative house of pain, because if you don't, you will be in a literal house of pain. Finally, we'll make sure that we're really good at deflecting blows with incredible parrying skills, which I don't have, thanks again, Jake. For stats, we'll be using the standard point array from the player's handbook. Roll for stats if you want, just keep your dexterity and charisma high enough for multi-classing. Dexterity will be number one, you're very fast and very sneaky. Charisma next, people have to like you enough to give you almost all of your cool stuff other than being very fast and very sneaky. Wisdom after that, slinking around in the shadows is easier with good perception. Follow that up with strength, jumping is strength based and you jump real good. Constitution is a bit low, if shadows are gonna die twice, first they have to die once but we're gonna dump intelligence, we just don't really need it, which might tip off that we're not making an artificer. That was an original consideration for the build, as they can get mechanical arms, but the wolf doesn't make his own arm thing, it's given to him, so we'll probably get something else to duplicate the insane mobility from a grapply arm. Now, I was gonna go Revenant, but technically you start the game as not a zombie, so we need a method of becoming undead later, meaning that we can start off as a variant human. If you don't like humans, make a Loxodon, I don't care. Variant humans can get a feat, the defensive duelist feat, lets you add your proficiency bonus to your AC as a reaction against one attack, letting you deflect blows with your sword, which is kind of important in Sekiro, so if you're bad at it, ask your friend Jake for the footage. If you're not friends with Jake, I pity you, he's the best. Bump your dexterity and wisdom with your two free points. Take Perception for your skill of choice so you can see all the places you want to yoink yourself over to. You're a soldier, so the soldier background will give you athletics and intimidation skills. You're good at climbing and jumping and the whole not being able to die thing is pretty spooky. We'll kick things off as a rogue. I waffled around picking a fighter or a monk as well, but if you want a solid sneak attack, there's really only one place to get it. Our undeath is also going to give us an extra attack option later, making us a decent fighter whether we have the drop on our foes or not. But if you do want the drop on your foes, grab some skills from the rogue list like acrobatic stealth, insight, and investigation. You can double your proficiency bonus with two of your skills thanks to expertise, I'd say athletics and stealth for maximum mobility and maximum bamboozlement. Bamboozlement is, of course, the most honorable form of combat as it lets you get your sneak attack on to deal an extra d6 of damage when you have advantage or an ally within five feet of an enemy you're attacking. Funnily enough, wolves in D&D get advantage when they have an ally within five feet and you're a wolf, but, but also not. Anyway, second level rogues get extra mobile with cunning action, letting you dash, disengage, or hide as a bonus action, helping you get away from people or dive in to take them out quickly up to you. Third level rogues can choose a roguish archetype, and thief doesn't necessarily mean that you're a thief. If that makes sense, it's basically for rogues who want to be extra mobile. You get second story work, letting you add your dexterity modifier to a long jump, and you can climb without spending extra movement, so thanks to cunning action, you can move up a 90 foot building in one round, which is like an 8 story building, and your running long jump is 15 feet, a pretty good start for grapply arm mobility, but we're going to get it even better later. You can also use fast hands, letting you use an object or pick a lock with your bonus action. Don't get captured, but if you do, this will get you out quick. Your sneak attack also increases to 2d6. Some people might feel a little bamboozled by me not using the new revived rogue. Don't worry, I'm still using Unearthed Arcana. I know everyone loves it so much. The issue is that you don't shoot zombie juice out of your hands or really get anything that that subclass would give you. It's still cool though. I'm a big fan of it and I would love to see it in Xanathar's 2 Electric Xanadu. Fourth level rogues get an ability score improvement. Bump up your dexterity for better slashes, better AC, better stealth, and better jump it's really everything you do right now and sadly everything you're gonna do forever because at this point I think you died that means the game's over wait the video's still going okay let's reboot and take some warlock levels specifically an undying warlock which is an unearthed arcana don't worry the real Tulak is still here undying warlocks are warlocks that died before some entity was like nope you work for me now mr corpse you're among the dead giving you advantage on saving throws against disease the spare the dying cantrip which automatically stabilizes a creature with zero hp so they don't have to roll death saves you can't be a fantasy babysitter if you don't know fantasy cpr undead creatures also have to make a wisdom saving throw of eight plus 
bonus or proficiency bonus and charisma modifier when they want to attack you if they fail they have to attack somebody else but this goes away once you attack them so they're probably going to be un undead by that point anyway you can grab two cantrips from the warlock list press the digitation lets you do some small magical stuff specifically i'm looking at the lighting torches or bonfires which you could use at a sculptor's idol to get a short rest or just like ask your dm to take a short rest because that's how that works true strike is the best cantrip in the game it gives you advantage on your next weapon attack as long as you're okay spending your current action to cast this cantrip and you maintain concentration until your next turn some people describe this as useless or worse than useless because it also wastes an action but they just don't have the big brain to use it to get a guaranteed sneak attack i'm sure everyone in the comments will agree with me that this is a great spell to put on your list and to cast for first level spells false life is on the undying list and lets you give yourself 1d4 plus 4 temporary hp for an hour for some extra zombie health protection from evil and good protects a creature from aberrations celestials elementals fey fiends undead giving those creatures disadvantage on attacks against your ward and they're unable to charm frighten or possess them for up to 10 minutes depending on your concentration giving you another great babysitting tool how many times does this happen where you're babysitting a kid and then they get possessed second level warlocks get eldritch invocations which are some extra abilities you get because some dude brought you back to life devil's sight gives you the best dark vision in the game for 120 feet of dark vision even in magical darkness pretty helpful when you mostly work at night armor of shadows lets you cast mage armor on yourself making your ac 13 plus your dexterity modifier which is a little bit better than the rogue standard studded leather third level warlocks can learn second level spells misty step lets you teleport 30 feet as a bonus action which works more like your prosthetic limb than a prosthetic limb from Eberron Wood because that's just like a regular prosthetic limb. Might as well cover all the new options because none of them are grappling hooks and I'm sure people will ask about them in the comments. Arm Blade just puts a weapon in your arm and Arcane Propulsion Arm is a rocket punch but there's no mobility property. And again, you didn't make your grapply arm, it was given to you. Speaking of things being given to you, it's been a while since we got a gift. The Pact of the Blade lets you pick a weapon you can summon as an action and it's magical in terms of overcoming resistances. Pick whatever thing you want to put in your prosthesis as long as it's a melee weapon i might also recommend you keep it finesse so that you can use your sneak attack with it but there's no requirement for that fourth level warlocks get another ability score improvement and will cap off our dexterity modifier it's sort of everything you do none of your spells are anything but flat buffs so you don't actually need a high charisma modifier for them fifth level warlocks get third level spells counter spell will let you shut down some magical shenanigans by stopping spells of third level or lower as a reaction shut down higher level spells with a charisma check of 10 plus the spells level but i believe in you you can do it hopefully that makes up for the whole not investing in the modifier thing that i just talked about you can also grab another invocation thirsting blade will let you make two attacks instead of one as an action with your packed weapon which is pretty great but remember you can only use sneak attack once per round so it's not a totally busted combo sixth level undying warlocks get to defy death which is one of the main reasons we're here letting you heal 1d8 plus your constitution modifier when you succeed on a death saving throw or stabilize someone with spare the dying so if you're down you just have to roll above a 10 once and you're back up and ready to go with eight health or less maybe pop false life that's still not much you can do this once per long rest so remember to stop by a sculptor's idol to make it recharge but there's no guarantee that that pops so let's continue to seventh level of warlock for fourth level spells from the undying Dying list death ward lets a creature say no to death once in the next eight hours dropping to one hp the first time they would drop to zero so you can guarantee your shadow will die twice even though that might technically make it die a third time oh well if it has to be better than the game i can live with that for this level's invocation improved packed weapon adds one to your attack and damage rolls with your packed weapon and you can conjure short bows long bows light crossbows and heavy crossbows if you want to get something ranged which should work well with your high dex score and sneak attack eighth level warlocks get another ability score improvement let's just invest in our constitution it's pretty low and things deal a lot of damage when they hit you just because you can die twice doesn't mean you have to ninth level warlocks get a fifth level spell legend lord gives you information about a person place or thing the more you already know about it the more information you get Sekiro is much more generous with its lore than other from software games obviously because the wolf knows the spell legend lore duh we're really here for otherworldly leap letting you cast the jump spell to triple your jump distance at will for 51 horizontal jump distance and 12 feet vertically in case you can't find something to climb with your second story work so why the hell wouldn't i just take magic initiate for jump why dive so deep into warlock well 
first level spells eventually run out, and Sekiro's grapple arm doesn't. It's also the most flavorful way to get a grappling arm, as it's something given to you by a person who resurrected you, which is literally how it works in the game. If I can get a one for one ability, I'm gonna do it. But at home, definitely get the rest of the rogue levels first. We're already at total level 13, and lots of campaigns don't even get this high. Back over to rogue now, fifth level rogues get to parry badly with uncanny dodge, letting you reduce incoming damage by half as a reaction, as long as you can see the damage is source. Your sneak attack damage also also increases to 3d6. Sixth level rogues get expertise in two more skills. Acrobatics and perception would always be nice. They'll help you break out of grapples and make sure that nothing sneaks up on you as well as you're sneaking up on them. Seventh level rogues get evasion, letting you take half damage on failed deck saves and no damage on successful ones. I'm not sure if a gorilla throwing its own feces counts as a deck save or a con save. I think it starts with a deck save and then becomes a con save. Either way, your sneak attack bumps up to 4d6. Eighth level rogues get an ability score improvement, more constitution here. Bodyguards gotta be thick, even if they're quick. Bars. Ninth level thief rogues get supreme sneak, giving you advantage on stealth checks if you only move half your movement in a turn. Thank God, because at this point your stealth modifier is only plus 17. You're basically wearing clogs. Your sneak attack damage also increases to 5d6. 10th level rogues get our last ability score improvement and I don't care about your charisma. So more constitution, we'll just keep getting those sweet late game HP buffs. Remember, buffing your constitution buffs your HP retroactively. So it's plus 19 at this level, not plus one. Our capstone is the 11th level of rogue for reliable talent, meaning that you can treat any role of a skill you have proficiency with as a 10, so you can't possibly get less than a 27 total for a stealth check. Your sneak attack also increases to 66 to take advantage of your ridiculous stealth skill. Now that we've hit level 20, let's figure out how viable this build is. First, you're incredibly sneaky. You won't get found unless you want to be, which means that the creature is friendly or it's being stabbed. You can also stab whatever creatures you want since your packed weapon is magical, so even if they're amazing legendary beasts, you'll carve through them just fine. Finally, you're crazy mobile, with great jump distance, misty step, and extra speed from cunning action to get you where you need to go. For weaknesses, you took 9 levels of a casting class for a first level spell, meaning you missed out on more sneak attack damage from Rogue. You're also of lacking spells with two misty steps per short rest then oops no more magic hope selling your soul was worth it finally your intelligence is low which could be rough in puzzle situations but protecting the divine air shouldn't involve a whole lot of math one sword plus one neck equals dead bad guy hooray that's all you need to know just make sure that you're not totally dependent on someone else for your abilities you're worth investing in all on your own thanks for watching if you like the video subscribe for more we make two videos every week Check out our side channel, Tulak and Manga, where we've played through Dark Souls 3. We haven't played through Sekiro yet, but maybe someday I'll be a glutton for punishment and get good enough to do that.